you. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Kim, I cut you off. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, for a general community member who's in quarantine for possible exposure to COVID, uh, the proposed recommendation is that he or she wait until the quarantine period is over to receive the vaccine. I agree with the reason behind, the, behind this proposed recommendation. Um, however, uh, for the person in quarantine, the quarantine period may overlap with the period of some protection that may be rendered by the first dose of the messenger RNA vaccine. Um, akin to a, a potentially exposed person in the community seeking COVID testing, a person in quarantine, particularly in priority populations, uh, might consider the vaccine to be very important, if not life-saving. Um, I want to be sensitive to, to public perception, so I'd like to ask this question. By withholding the vaccine for a general community member who's in quarantine for whom the vaccine would otherwise be indicated, uh, to put it simply, is a potentially beneficial medical intervention being denied, albeit temporarily? Thank you for, thank you for that comment. Thank you. Um, okay, I see no other hands. Um, so, uh, Dr. Dormitzer, please. Yes, uh, Phil Dormitzer here, uh, Chief Scientific Officer for uh, Oral Vaccine Dispizer. Uh, during the discussion, uh, two uh, requests uh, uh, for additional information uh, from Pfizer came up that I think I can address. Uh, one has to do with the uh, developmental and reproductive toxicity study. That questions as to the timing and any preliminary information. Um, we plan to have a uh, quality controlled uh, final report on that study uh, ready for submission to FDA uh, later this month. And what I can say at this point is the preliminary uh, data show no indication of either a developmental uh, or reproductive toxicity. The second question that came up is uh, regards the identity of the uh, other uh, licensed medication that shares some components uh, with uh, the vaccine. Uh, and that medication is on Patro. And maybe people may not be familiar with it. That's O N P A T T R O, or generic name uh, uh, Patisiran, P A T I S I R A N. It's a um, medication that to treat the polyneuropathy caused by hereditary ATTR amyloidosis. Like the vaccine, it contains RNA. Uh, it shares two lipids, cholesterol and DSPC and has two other uh, lipids that are uh, not the same, but are of similar classes, uh, an ionizable amino lipid and a pegylated lipid. Um, it's used in far greater quantity than the vaccine. And in the question um, I heard about it, there was a question about contraindication, and I just wanted to clarify that uh, we brought it up before because we were asked, is there another medication that shares any components, not because we have any particular concern. Uh, it was simply for information uh, because, because people wanted to know if there is another medication that shares some components with the vaccine. Thank you for, your, uh, for those comments for the clarification. Um, Dr. Lee, I see your hand is up. Yes, I just wanted to follow up on Ms. McNally's point. Um, I think and it's, it's, sorry, it's taking me a little while to register all this, so uh, I appreciate the EUA fact sheets, and I actually, um, looking through the CDC Vaccine Communication Toolkit website, it is incredibly helpful and incredibly rich with information. Um, I think the reason uh, perhaps the question is uh, relevant is for those who are setting up vaccination clinics. Um, I had kind of uh, been assuming that the EUA fact sheet would be the uh, corollary to the VIS, which I recognize uh, it is intended to be. Um, but just in terms of um, usability and um, being able to educate more fluidly, um, I think some of the CDC communication toolkit information is actually really helpful information to also provide. And so I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what the most efficient way is to educate our um, folks. So um, our call could just thank, thank you, Dr. Lee. So um, <laughs> to clarify, you are correct that um, the uh, patient fact sheet is is substantially longer than the BIS statement. We do have a uh, a, a CDC product that is a one maybe both sides but one pager uh, that d is more consumer friendly uh, and more similar to the information that would be on a BIS statement. Uh, we uh, are just reviewing those two the developed product with the EUA 
um, language to make sure it aligns. So that will be put up on the uh, on the same healthcare toolkit where all of the other information is. I also want to um, let you know that we also are working on a and finalizing a. Uh, a screening checklist type of tool for providers to use who who need to ask um, who to take them through a series of questions, not that many, um, to um, to screen patients uh, prior to the vaccination about whether or not they would need more information, such as um, information about uh, pregnancy and lactation, or information about any of these other issues. Um, and so uh, we are working on that, and that will also be available in the near future, um, especially after um, we finalize our clinical considerations um, using the uh, input that you guys have given us all today. Thank you so much. Um, can I just clarify one? So I very much appreciate that, and um, I'm really grateful that CDC has worked so hard on these communications. And I recognize, again, just sort of it's impossible to build communications when uh, the information gets just released, you know, 24 hours before, not even. Um, but are, as, as vaccinators, should we be giving out the EUA fact sheet plus perhaps a more user-friendly fact sheet? Is that the intent? That are, are both going to be required? Yes, that would be, that would be our um, intent is to have, um, you know, the, the requirement is to provide the patient with the EUA fact sheet. Um, but we, um, We'll have additional uh, materials that we are hopeful uh, providers will use, and we'll continue to promote this toolkit um, so that people can download uh, these uh, these information sheets and provide them to patients. Thank you. We are appreciative. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paling. All right. So uh, I want to follow up on Dr. Lee's question, and um, I may have misunderstood. So first of all, thank you to everybody who's trying to create very patient-friendly information um, as we prepare uh, as, uh, for vaccination. Um, am I, un uh, I understand this, uh, Pfizer has produced an EUA fact sheet. Is the CDC also performing, is it also called an EUA fact sheet? No. Um I do not have the title of the document. Um, it's, the title of the document will be more something like what you need to know about, you know, information for patients about the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. It's not, it's, it does not look the same or um, appear to be the same. And it's clearly identified as a CDC product and different than the Pfizer um, EUA fact sheet. And um, over. Okay. Okay, perfect. So there will be a Pfizer UA, uh, EUA fact sheet and then a what you need to know about the vaccine from the CDC and both are recommended to be distributed. That's fantastic. Um, so then the second question is about the screening checklist tool for vaccination. And um, when I looked at the writing and the wording for pregnant or lactating women, the choice was given to them about if they wanted to get vaccinated or if they wanted to seek uh, additional information from their physicians. I am, uh, wanted to make sure that in the screening checklist, we are not creating a barrier in requiring additional things for pregnant or lactating women. This is Dr. Massonier. Um, so, um, again, we've had the benefit of ongoing um, Council with ACOG and AP and other partners in this space um, for weeks as our team um, anticipated the need to be um, clearer in this space. And so, you know, we will be following their lead, agree with the concern about not wanting to create barriers and um, the need to balance ensuring that folks are fully informed. Um, we are happy for all your comments. As Dr. Lee said, you know, it's sort of um, the materials that you're talking about are coming. Many of them were drafted out and sort of mocked up in advance. But since the EUA just came through last night, and frankly, we wanted to get your feedback on some of these con clinical considerations now, we're not finalized yet. Um, but our intention and our plan is to have a whole set of materials available before the vaccine is available in jurisdictions, which is Monday, 
That being said, you will ex um, you should anticipate us continuing to refine and um, produce additional materials rapidly over the course of the week. So we'll get up what we can this weekend, but expect, frankly, every day this week for there to be more materials and the same next week if we go according to plan and there's a second vaccine. So hear everything. Wish we would have had it in advance, but time just isn't our friend in this setting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Messonnier. I want to remind um, voting members and anybody making comments that we want to stay within the, the discussion points listed on your screen. Um, these fine points of, of the words missing and what needs to be contained in the documents uh, can be worked out afterwards. So let me go on to uh, another um, question or comment by Dr. Talbot. Yes, and I have uh, something to go along with those questions. So something I would like to be included in the cl clinical considerations, maybe not today, but in, in the near future, as y'all are planning on updating this regularly, is the idea of the drive-through vaccination. I think that is something that many of us have thought of as an efficient way of giving this vaccine um, to reduce contact and spread of COVID among people coming to get vaccinated. The current guidelines would discourage that due to the 15 minute wait and the 30 minute wait, but I'm hoping as we learn more data about these allergic reactions and can um, better, um, better define what it is and, and, and reduce the risk, I think it would be nice if there was some kind of comment on the idea of a drive through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Just uh, thank you. I just had a, uh, a quick question about um, whether or not the uh, written consent is required at all for the um, special populations or whether it's just distribution of the EUA and uh, possibly other materials from the CDC. This is this is Dr. Oliver. Uh, under an EUA, there is no consent, uh, informed consent that has to, to be obtained uh, for any population to receive the vaccine under an EUA. So I want to thank everyone for their uh, comments, their questions. Um, and, and we're now going to move on to um, another uh, topic, which is um, we're going to look at some slides uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Cohn tells me that uh, she would like um, discussion on um, and uh, with regard to proposed language. I am I correct, Dr. Cohn? Yes. As we're pulling up this, uh, the next set of slides, I will just uh, clarify that while there's no uh, informed consent that uh, requires signature, there are um, there is assent and there is a, an expectation that individuals will be informed about the vaccine through the patient FAQ sheet and that patients will uh, have the choice to be vaccinated. Okay, thank you. This is Dr. Oliver. Um, so wanted to walk through um, the policy questions that um, are being uh, proposed and any uh, future language for votes. So the policy question is, should vaccination with the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine be recommended for persons 16 years of age and older under an emergency use authorization? Next slide. I just want to um, remind the ACIP members the summary of the work group interpretations um, and the, uh, that the balance of consequences, the desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable consequences in most settings um, and that the type of recommendation proposed by the work group is we recommend the intervention. Next slide. Proposed language for the ACIP vote is the Pfizer-BioNTech 
COVID-19 vaccine is recommended for persons 16 years of age and older in the U.S. population under the FDA's emergency use authorization. Next slide. For the, um, there would also be a vote to, um, uh, for an amendment to the adult and child and adolescent immunization schedule with the language for that vote being to recommend the proposed amendment to the 2021 adult, child, and adolescent immunization schedules, which I'll detail further. Next slide. So for the adult schedule, a text box on the notes page has been added that states ACIP recommends the use of COVID-19 vaccines within the scope of the emergency use authorization or biologics license application for the particular vaccine. ACI, interim ACIP recommendations for the use of COVID-19 vaccines can be found at, and then there's a link to the ACIP COVID-19 vaccine recommendations page. The purpose of this statement is to address the timing for coverage under the ACA covered health insurance plans. The CARES Act shortened the effective date of ACA coverage from one year to 15 business days after the ACIP recommendation and CDC director adoption. That means that insurance companies will have 15 business days after the Pfizer recommendation vote and adoption until they will be mandated to cover COVID-19 vaccine administration fees. By generically listing COVID-19 vaccines rather than just the Pfizer vaccine in this ACIP ACA recommendation, the intent is to cover all COVID-19 vaccines after the initial 15 business days effective date is met so there will be no delay in coverage as additional COVID-19 vaccines are recommended. Next slide. And here is the child and adolescent schedule notes page with the same addition. So if we'll go back to slide three with the proposed interim recommendation. Um, and I'll open that up for discussion, thank you. Dr. Cohen, do, do you want to clarify if um, those individuals with conflicts of interest can uh, comment on these uh, on these um, uh, proposals? Thanks, Dr. Romero. No, as we as we begin the deliberation of the um, language to vote on, um, uh, the uh, members with conflicts of interest should um, abstain from discussion. So, uh, so for those that jo joined late, I, I will specify. Um, uh, doctors Atmar, Fry, and Hunter have indicated they have conflict of interest that preclude their ability to vote and discuss this portion of the um, of the session. So uh, we're open um, for discussion, and I see Dr. Bell. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to um, I, I want to talk for a moment about how um, it is envisioned that this recommendation will be tied to the allocation recommendations. I, I had thought that we were going to somehow or another explicitly say that. And without that, I, I'm, I'm quite concerned that there's going to be some confusion um, with this language, um, I say, without some recognition that while there's, this is a general recommendation, that's fine but um, that this is not that the ACIP is saying that anybody, everybody should go out and get vaccinated. And especially tying it to the schedule and not having anything in the schedule that says during a, you know, there's an allocation scheme here. Um, I'm concerned that, you know, people may try to game the system and also that just everybody's gonna be very confused about what is the ACIP recommending? Are we actually recommending this right now for everyone 16 years of age or older in the U.S. population. And so I, I would be much more comfortable, uh, this, this language is okay for what it is, but I would be much more com comfortable if we could please be explicit about the fact that the current interim recommendation is being made in the time of constrained supply and therefore the specific populations covered are included in an allocation recommendation. And then obviously currently it's healthcare providers and people who live in long-term care facilities. So I, 
I would like some additional discussion about this um, and hear CDC's perspective because, as I say, I, I, if I were John Q. Public, I would be very confused. Dr. Romero, this is Dr. Messonnier, if it's okay for CDC to respond. Please do. Uh, uh, Dr. Bell, thank you very much for that comment. Um, we very much concur um, to, as to the importance of not um, having this language lead to confusion about the situation we find ourselves in currently, which is a situation where there is limited supply and therefore um, a, a, a careful attention to prioritization. While it's not in the actual recommendation language, in the draft MMWR, there is language that frames it in exactly what you're um, uh, um, asking, and perhaps it might be helpful if um, if we read the language in the MM, this is the draft MMWR language, so you can sort of hear it in context. This is Dr. Oliver. Um, the sentence included in the draft language of the MMWR states, the recommendation for the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine should be implemented in conjunction with ACIP's interim recommendation for allocating initial supplies of COVID-19 vaccines with a reference to link directly to the, the previous publication of the MMWR interim allocation recommendations. Okay, uh, that's great. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I, I will still say that I would be happier if that language was included in the vote, in the wording for the vote. Dr. Bell doesn't need a second for this, but but um, I, I think that she has a, a very good point. Yeah, so this is CDC. Again, we am. Um, we understand your point, but we have actually gotten counsel here at CDC, and it, it is not possible for us to include that language in this way. Um, you know, part of the issue, again, is that this is a recommendation to use or not use a vaccine. Um, while we will ensure that in all the communication, we link the two, the actual recommendation is a recommendation for the vaccine or not for the vaccine. and 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 therefore, we really can't proceed with the language that links them in the way that you asked. Again, we did um, we did check on that and are, and are very clear with the with the conclusion that um, that that that's not going to be possible. But again, in our communication material, which frankly sometimes I think is more important because that's what the public and healthcare professionals see, we will frame it in the way that you heard with the linkage to the prioritization. And I would point out that, you know, we expect in the next months for the um, supply to increase such that the, we move on from these early prioritization recommendations and would not want to have to come back to ACIP um, every time we, we, we change phases. And so um, that's also the reason that we've been asked to keep this in, in, in the way that it's written now and not link it to the prioritization recommendation. Over. Thank you for that for, for that clarification and the context in which this is being um, um, uh, proposed. Uh, Dr. Bell, did you have any other comments that you wanted, wanted to make? No, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, let me clarify one thing. I see some um, some hands from uh, liaison members up, and um, at this point, we are uh, specifically uh, requesting comments from the voting members only uh, because this is a. a uh, something that they will uh, vote on. So I'm sorry if I, I, I don't mean to exclude you. Dr. Uh, Lee. Thank you. I did I did want to um, uh, in, endorse uh, support for ensuring that this recommendation could be used flexibly because we anticipate uh, the, uh, we might go into phase 1B and 1C. And so um, uh, would appreciate not having emergency meetings every time we moved into another phase, uh, as long as our intent is clear. So agree with Dr. Bell's intent and uh, making sure that that gets communicated clearly, um, that this is uh, uh, assuming that there's limited supply that the allocation framework recommended by ACIP would be used accordingly. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is I also appreciate that the states under the FDA's emergency use authorization, I actually think that's an important addition uh, 
with regard to the fact that we discussed yesterday, the importance of re-reviewing the, um, the, the grade and the ETR with additional information when the BLA comes up, which we hope will happen. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alt. Dr. Romero, if it's appropriate, nobody else has any other comments, I'd be glad to make a motion that we accept this language. Dr. Cohen, did you, can we accept the vote, uh, accept the motion at this time? Uh, Dr. Romero, that is uh, your decision, but there was a motion that was just put on the table. So if somebody okay. wants to second it, that would be okay. Very good. I just wanted to make sure we weren't jumping out of schedule if you had something else for us to look at. Very good. May I please have a second? Um, Dr. Paling, was your hand up to second? Dr. Sanchez, is your hand up to second? Yes, it's fine. I agree with the language and with the um, with the, all that's been discussed with respect to the allocation as well. So, yes, so I, you, sec you, I second it, yes. Very good. So we have um, a motion and a second. Um, is there further discussion? Okay. We will take a vote on this. Um, go ahead, uh, after, after public comment, of course, but uh, go ahead, Dr. Cohen, were you going to say something? No, I just saw Dr. Lee raised her hand um, and I wanted to let you know. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. I was looking down at the computer. Yes, Dr. Lee, please. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to make a brief statement uh, before we voted. Um, just a couple of uh, key points uh, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, number one, uh, I want to emphasize uh, to the public who, who are listening to this meeting that we have uh, absolutely followed our routine process using the grade and the ETR framework in open ACIP meetings as we do for all vaccines. Um, I did want to make a statement that some of the concerns about the speed of approval and um, uh, this is at multiple steps and I, I recognize we are yet to vote, but I wanted to get this out before the vote um, have been raised, but I also wanted to emphasize that we have a process that's timely and responsive to the pandemic. Um, I truly hope that the ACIP deliberations have emphasized that these the deliberations have been thorough, transparent, and timely, and reassures the public, um, regardless of the outcome of the vote. I also wanted to, again, highlight the imbalance that was brought up earlier uh, between the investment in vaccine development and supply chain and the investment in vaccine delivery infrastructure. As you know, um, part of our evidence recommendation framework does um, think critically about values, acceptability, resource use, and implementation considerations. Um, and as part of that infrastructure is this robust communication and outreach program that's needed in order to um, actually enhance access, acceptability, and the real world use of the vaccine. Um, so we saw estimates of $8.5 trillion impact on health alone, and that doesn't even consider the economic impact to individuals and families across the US. Um, and we did see a $10 billion investment in vaccine development and distribution, which has been extremely successful. Yet we're hearing in the news that only a small fraction, maybe seven, several hundred million, has been invested in the delivery infrastructure. And so, you know, I'm making this plea to our lawmakers that they support the public health infrastructure, which is really needed to respond to this pandemic. Uh, I am confident we will do our job at ACIP, and I hope that others will also follow through uh, in the support that's needed uh, for this vote to be a successful one. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to make a comment? There will be time for comment after the vote also. So Dr. Romero, I just want to remind everyone that um, we are, the motion is on the table. We will um, go to the next one when there's no more discussion around this one um, and then take public comment and then return for the ACIP members to vote. Um, ACIP members will have the opportunity to comment on the um, on their vote, make a statement about why they voted the way they did after the vote. Um, but if any liaison organizations want to make any comments um, regarding the vote, um, this is the time to do so now. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Liaisons, please. I'm not seeing any. So we have one more slide. This is the language for the amendment to the 2021 adult and child and adolescent immunization schedule that we recommend the proposed amendments to the 2021 adult and child and adolescent immunization schedules that were presented previously. Very good, thank you. 
Um, I see a hand by Dr. Paling. Yes, um, I wanted to make a motion to approve this amendment or this um, wording. Thank you. We have a motion to approve uh, this um, uh, recommendation. Um, Dr. Bata, your hand is up after her. Did you wish to make a comment or a, a motion or second? I would, like, I would like to second their motion. Thank you. So we have um, a motion and it has been second. Uh, do we have comment from the ACIP members at this time? Not seeing any, let me open it up to the liaison members. Again, not seeing any, let me move it back to Dr. Cohen for the next, um, next language uh, proposal to be uh, considered. So Dr. Romero, this is, um, we combined the childhood, adolescent, and okay. adult immunization schedules. So we are um, complete uh, with the uh, proposed votes that we would, with the, with the motions that we would uh, like for ACIP to make today. Uh, I propose we take a break until 145 and return for the public comment session at that time. May, may I ask a question, Dr. Cohn? Of course. So um, I, I may not have the, the final schedule in front of me, but um, for the vote, for clarification for me, um, we have three votes. Um, will the vote then be two votes, um, one for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and the second for this word, uh, this uh, um, proposal before us? Yes, apologies, actually. I am looking at the agenda now and I do see we have three votes listed, but um, we, um, in the same way that we voted on the adult and child immunization schedule as a single vote in October, we can do the same with the amendment because we um, combined that vote in October. So there will be two votes after the public comment session. Thank you. So I, I, I point that out to the voting members, the liaisons and the public um, listening. There will only be two votes when we return um, after uh, the public comment. Um, so we will go into a break for 15 minutes. Um, we'll come back at 10 minutes before the hour. Thank you all very much.
five minutes to reconvene the meeting. Okay, I need to call me. Um, please don't forget to unmute uh, to mute your uh, speakers, please. Dr. Romero, uh, this is uh, Amanda. Can you hear me? I can. Great. I yes. hope that it is 150. Do you want to, um, yes. are you ready or do yes. you want to give? Okay, great. No. All right. So we'll begin now with the uh, public comment session. Uh, unless Dr. Cohn, you have anything else to say before we begin it? No, go for it. Thank you. Um, so um, at the onset, um, I'd like to welcome and thank the public comment speakers for addressing the committee today. Uh, your comments are very important uh, to our deliberations and votes. 
Um, all speakers today submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters was determined uh, by a lottery. Um, I want to point out uh, to the speakers that uh, we have an extremely limited period of public comment. Um, in order to make it through all of the listed speakers, it is extremely important that each of the speakers limits his or her comments uh, or remarks to three minutes. Um, there is a circle uh, on your computer screens that indicates uh, the time remaining. It will, it will cycle through uh, three phases of color. Um, and um, when you reach the end of your time, uh, you will hear me say, thank you for your comment. Your time has expired. If you um, exceed that time by 15 seconds, you will hear from me as a courtesy to other speakers. We ask that you conclude your comment. Um, and then if you continue to speak for another 15 seconds, I will state your comment time has ended. Thank you. And we will cut the microphone. So again, thank you for making the time to speak to us today. Let me just get the first speaker. So uh, let's begin with uh, Mr. Uh, David Curry. Um, Mr. Curry, please state your affiliation um, and then uh, your comments, please. Thank you. Um, this is David Curry, president of the GE2P2 Global Foundation and head of its Center for Vaccine Ethics and Policy. I'm also affiliate faculty at the Division of Medical Ethics at NYU's School of Medicine. By way of disclosure, our foundation receives support from a range of individuals and organizations, including Pfizer and the Gates Foundation, to support a free weekly digest reviewing peer-reviewed literature and global strategic developments in immunization and public health. Our comment focuses on a key element supporting responsibly and ethically sound deployment of the pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine and others likely to follow very soon. This key element involves the information to be presented to recipients and caregivers as they are offered or seek vaccination. We argue that this information must be clear, must be appropriately written and presented for liter limited literacy and reading levels, be broadly translated for the diverse populations that will need to be vaccinated and, uh, and otherwise uh, pre present alternative vaccine options as they become available and be otherwise supportive of recipients in making well-informed decisions to accept the vaccine. We recognize that the FDA emergency use authorization does not require formal informed consent and that the information uh, to be provided at a minimum is via the fact sheet for recipients and caregivers. In examining the EUA fact sheet now posted, we note that it is presented in text only with no graphical information to assist recipient comprehension, even though the fact sheet for providers does include graphical information, is presented at a reading level that does not appear to align with lower reading or literacy levels, and is limited to a document in English with no translations posted or any indication that translations will be posted. We are enthusiastic that Dr. Cohn at the ACIP meeting December 1st reported that additional supporting information was in development to enable informed consent for individuals offered vaccines in long-term care facilities. The CDC toolkit now posted, apart from that focus to healthcare workers, appears to be generic and for all recipients. Um, and apart from the limited depth of that content, these web resources seem to be available only in English. We are concerned that, especially with the mention of ASCENT today, the posted content will not be robust enough to effectively respond uh, to the information needs of long-term care uh, individuals and caregivers or to the serious levels of vaccine hesitancy operative across many vulnerable and hard-to-reach populations. We urge energetically urge and are confident that CDC will extend its best efforts to enhance these materials. And we urge ACIP to continue to closely assess the supplementary information. And for your comment, your time has expired. As it emerges to ensure that it adequately supports the intent of its recommendations. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Our next speaker is Mrs. Barbara Lofke. 
This is Loki. Yes, my name is Barbara Lepke, and I speak on behalf of many concerned Americans like myself. The ASAP committee is the last gatekeeper protecting the American public. We all know that the president has pushed for fast tracking these vaccines. We all know that the vaccine manufacturers are for-profit companies that stand to make hundreds of billions of dollars. We hope you remember that you have no duty to them. You have a duty to the American public, to each person, a duty to do no harm first. The public who will rely on your recommendations for this fast track vaccine won't have heard the words and phrases I've heard while watching these meetings the last few months. Words like should and probable and potentially. Phrases like we don't know yet. We'll know as the study progresses. We'll know that in the future. We hope to have that answer soon. We estimate and we believe. And comments like we have no data on reverse transcriptase of the RNA into DNA. Well, it's possible we don't think so. Or so the vaccine doesn't prevent transmission? That's correct, we have no data on that. We know that the Pfizer chairman, Albert Borla, has even admitted that the company was not certain if the vaccine prevented the coronavirus from being transmitted, saying this is something that needs to be examined. It's obvious that this vaccine has not been thoroughly tested yet. I have great concern, as do many, as I listen to the committee members find ways to try to explain away the concerns of the vaccine in areas such as pregnancy and anaphylactic reactions, rather than turning to the manufacturers to make it safer. If you vote yes, will you inform the public that there are many questions that still have not been answered about this vaccine? That there are still questions about the long-term effects? Or will you try to dismiss those in order to increase the vaccine uptake? In discussions about vaccine hesitancy by the committee, I never hear the committee admit that the CDC has a spotty history with minorities. The public has not forgotten the CDC's Tuskegee experiment, the MMR experiment on babies, or the years of sterilization procedures done on the incompetent. Don't let this fast-track drug become another cautionary tale for the CDC. I hope you take this all seriously. Thank you for your time. Thank you for those comments. Our next speaker is Mr. Kerbit Kubit. Mr. Kubit. Thank you. Based on all the available evidence, including 90% reduction in cases between vaccinated and placebo recipients, antigen titers, and data on adverse events, the BNT 162B2 vaccine appears safe, efficacious, and having a highly positive benefit risk ratio for patients from 16 to over 75. It is appropriate to allocate the first doses to healthcare workers. According to Dr. Dooling's MMWR report of December 3rd, there have been 245,000 cases of COVID-19 and 858 COVID-related deaths among U.S. healthcare personnel. The guidance for identifying Injection effects and separating those from COVID-19 infection should also be available to long-term care facilities and staff, where a high priority for that age group over 65, in which a 70% of deaths has occurred, is necessary. I have a relative in assisted living where there have been five coronavirus cases in staff and three among uh, residents. Allocation of the vaccine should also be prioritized for American, Indian, and Alaska Native communities, which experience disproportionately high infection and mortality, including among persons aged 20 to 49. Their COVID mortality has been around eight to 10 times higher than among white persons, according to Dr. Jessica Arizola's report of December 11. The Moderna vaccine, which has a similar structure mechanism of action encoding messenger RNA for the coronavirus spike protein and similar efficacy should also be approved quickly. There also need to be tools for telling the public and doctors about their place in priority allocation phases to avoid tying up doctors' offices and phone lines with people seeking information about vaccine availability and 
uh, their priority. In addition, the, the, uh, the public health in infrastructure should have multiple vaccines approved so that urban areas with ultra cold storage can receive those vaccines and rural areas which do not have access to the same stringent logistical requirements can obtain other vaccines. And as we know, under an EUA, these are not approved. So other vaccines are also uh, available for EUA. Thank you to the ACIP. Thank you to the FDA. And as someone said, let's get the logistical supply infrastructure out there. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for your comments. Next is Mr. Peter Matz. Mr. Matt. Good afternoon, and what an exciting day it is. I think we can all see the light at the end of the tunnel after FDA's authorization last night. My name is Peter Matz, and I'm here representing FMI, the Food Industry Association, where I'm the Director of Food and Health Policy. First and foremost, thank you to the Advisory Committee for your leadership and tireless efforts to provide guidance, not just to the CDC, but to all of the states and jurisdictions modeling their plans after your recommendations. The importance of the COVID vaccines can't be overstated, and FMI greatly appreciates all of your hard work. By way of background, as the Food Industry Association, FMI works with and on behalf of the entire industry, from retailers who sell to consumers and producers who supply the food, all the way to supermarket pharmacies to advance safer and more efficient consumer supply chains for both food and pharmaceuticals. In total, FMI member companies operate around 33,000 grocery stores and 12,000 pharmacies ultimately touching the lives of more than 100 million U.S. households per week and representing an industry with nearly 6 million employees. FMI appreciates this opportunity to share feedback. First, we strongly support ASIP's recommendation to prioritize healthcare personnel in the initial phase of COVID vaccine allocation, and we thank the committee for clarifying that this includes pharmacy workers. Supermarket pharmacies stand ready to be part of this historic vaccination effort, and supermarkets are also prepared to offer sites for vaccine administration and support for outreach efforts on the importance of getting vaccinated while they continue providing nutrition, supplements, and pharmacy services in the interim. Having said that, FMI respectfully requests that food industry essential workers be prioritized for COVID vaccinations after that initial phase of vaccine allocation. Designated by the federal government as part of the nation's critical infrastructure, the food industry has continued, bolstered, and at times shifted operations to ensure American families across the country have access to our products. And prioritizing COVID vaccinations for these workers would allow a key intervention to protect the food supply and keep supply chains operating. Therefore, we ask ASIP to follow the examples set by the National Academy's final framework for COVID vaccine allocation, which recommends prioritizing food industry essential workers behind healthcare workers in certain high-risk populations, and also the CDC's updated COVID vaccination program playbook which, suge which suggests that states and jurisdictions consider including food industry workers in phase 1B. And finally, we would also ask ASIP to consider prioritizing workers supporting the supply of personal hygiene, household, and commercial cleaning products. The latter is especially significant as consumers, retailers, and the food sector, among others, are being directed to use cleaning supplies, sanitizers, disinfectants, and other hygienic supplies to prevent the spread of COVID. So please do keep in mind the importance of those workers supplying critical personal and commercial cleaning supplies, as well as other essential consumer goods. FMI appreciates the opportunity to provide, to provide input on this critically important issue. Thank you initiative. for your comment. Your time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next uh, speaker is Ms. Julie Russell. Ms. Russell. Hello, thank you committee for your hard work in providing the best for our country. As the elected representative of the Coronado Unified School District, I am speaking today to request that the critical decision makers on your committee prioritize teachers, frontline school staff, and at-risk students in receiving the vaccination. Our teachers have provided distance learning instructions since the imposed school closure. In surveying our stakeholders, students and parents, we have learned that instruction provided solely through distance learning platforms 
cannot fulfill the academic and social emotional needs of all of our students. Despite our best efforts over the last nine months, some students are not thriving. We acknowledge there's still risk from the spread of COVID-19 and that until there is a widespread vaccine available for all, strong mitigating efforts must be maintained. Masks, social distancing, sanitation efforts will be with us for at least the remainder of the school year. However, access to the vaccine for our staff would ensure our students can be with us in person. We ask that you recognize the importance of the safety of our staff and how many young lives each of them touch. We need our educators to be confident in returning safely to the classroom to resume the invaluable and essential work of educating our students. This is especially important in the public sector where strong union influences hesitate to returning teachers back to the classroom to provide an equitable opportunity for all American children. I'll even go out on a limb and say this is a critical thing for our wider economy. It is important to get our kids back into the classroom and the first step on this would be a prioritization of vaccinating staff. Thank you very much for this critical consideration. And those are my comments. Thank you very much for those comments. Let me ask um, Mr. Um, John Allen uh, to come forward. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm John Allen, Vice President for Regulatory Affairs and International Standards with the International Dairy Food Association, which represents the nation's dairy food manufacturing and marketing industry. However, I'm here today representing a broader alliance of food, agriculture, and consumer goods industries associations to ask for your help and to express our thanks to CDC staff and members of the ACIP for your dedication to getting our country through these unprecedented times as quickly and as safely as possible. We fully agree that phase 1B prioritization of the workforce is a needed defense measure to ensure that our essential workers are protected remain healthy and can continue ensuring the production and distribution of safe food and other necessary consumer goods to sustain the U.S. population through the pandemic. But we need your help to make this happen. Please continue to recognize and prioritize access to COVID vaccines for frontline and other essential employees across our critical infrastructure sectors. Without your support for prioritization, our supply chains could eventually fall apart, creating widespread disruptions to our economy. And as the country is on the cusp of initiating the COVID vaccination campaign, yesterday we submitted written comments into the docket for this meeting, laying out suggested guidelines for sub-prioritizing among essential workers within our sectors for vaccination when necessary, particularly during phases 1B and 1C when supplies are expected to be limited. We will be sharing these guidelines with state governors and public health departments all at all levels across the country. As vaccine allocation and needs at the local levels will vary inevitably from state to state and locality to locality, these guidelines will likely need to be tailored by local public health officials in coordination with companies within these sectors. To this end, we are encouraging our member companies across the country to reach out to their local health departments to begin discussing plans for vaccination of their employees immediately, including identification of those employees who should receive the first rounds of vaccination. There is indeed very strong support among the public for government partnering with the private sector to distribute vaccines to essential workers. So I urge you to help, help us harness that support. To conclude, we offer our help and support in working with CDC and along with other state and local officials in any way we can before and after vaccines are launched, including help in communicating the benefits of vaccination to our essential employees. So please don't hesitate to contact us if you see any such opportunities for collaboration. Thank you and thanks again for your time today. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker will be Ms. Uh, Allison, uh, Ms. Hall Allison uh, Haygood. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Haygood. I am a co-author of the book, Your Baby's Best Shot, Why Vaccines Are Safe and Save Lives and a community college psychology professor. I am here providing public comment as a private citizen and vaccine advocate. 
I would like to thank the committee for all of your hard work regarding the development of vaccines for COVID-19, for your transparency throughout the process, and for your willingness to invite public comment. I would like to provide public comment on several issues regarding the COVID-19 vaccines. Number one, communities of color, particularly the African-American community, have valid distrust of the medical establishment. Thoughtful work with national and local leaders of communities of color is vital to address these communities' concerns in a way that honors their historical experiences. It's important to let these communities take the lead in figuring out what information would be most helpful to address their issues and to develop a system of allocation and distribution that is equitable across demographic groups to avoid exacerbating existing inequities. Number two, people who are incarcerated and people experiencing homelessness should be prioritized given that their situations make it difficult to adequately isolate or quarantine or to obtain masks or facilities for bathing. Incarceration or homelessness should not be a death sentence. Number three, an educational infrastructure for the general public is needed to address concerns regarding the rapid nature of the development of these vaccines. The general public is not aware that the research and development process usually involves a great deal of unused time waiting for various approvals and funding sources, and that all of that wait time was eliminated during the process of prioritizing these vaccines. Providing this information to the general public may alleviate many of the concerns expressed regarding how quickly we have been able to get to this point. My co-author and I, in an article published in the journal Human Vaccines and Immunotherapeutics, proposed a multi-source model of education to address the concerns of people who are hesitant about vaccines. In such a model, everyone with whom a person comes in contact, from public health departments to physicians to nurses in vaccine clinics to scheduling assistants, is a source of accurate information regarding vaccines. In the body of research regarding vaccine education, and in my experience in combating vaccine misinformation, merely providing factual information is unlikely to alleviate concerns regarding vaccine safety and efficacy. Instead, medical and public health professionals would do better by soliciting information on people's specific concerns and target information to those concerns. Since conspiracy theories are already being created regarding these vaccines, the rapid development of an educational program to provide accurate, transparent information is critical. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Anne Lewandowski. Ms. Lewandowski. And good afternoon. My name is Ann Lewandowski, and I'm representing the Rural Wisconsin Health Cooperative and the Wisconsin Immunization Neighborhood. We would like to take, thank the committee and work group members for their hard work during a global pandemic when you have many demands on your time. We are deeply appreciative of the, com of the committee's thoughts on rural health care personnel. We have been very worried about the feasibility of Pfizer's vaccine with the ultra cold chain and a large minimum order for rural members in Wisconsin. We would like to thank the committee for their thoughts in considering these, uh, these challenges during the discussion today. We ask the CDC not to ignore the challenges of the ultra cold chain in the large minimum order as the thermal shippers only serve one location. Subdivisions at the state level mean that the vaccine is distributed uh, into a refrigerated state, which limits stability to five days. Our hospitals are busy with the surge, struggling with staffing challenges driven by exposures in the community at work. Further, furthermore, our informational surveys highlight a workforce that is strongly vaccine hesitant of these vaccines due to the lack of formal information and guidance until very recently. These challenges should not be underestimated. It has been reported that the Pharmacy Long-Term Care Partnership will receive thermal shippers of 125 doses. We hope the CDC considers how to ensure equitable access to this reduced minimum order size across locations that need it, including rural areas. We urge the CDC to release the clinical education materials as soon as possible. As previously mentioned, our hospitals and clinics are seeing a surge in COVID-19 cases and need time to apply to allow staff education required for the storage handling and administration of this vaccine. Our providers are anticipating swift delivery of this vaccine with a rapid move to administration. We urge the MMWR to include the thoughtful communications and recommendations for healthcare personnel who have allergic reactions, immunocompromising and autoimmune disorders and are pregnant and breastfeeding and or other special populations you discussed during your conversation today. We appreciate the committee's thoughtful discussion. And personally, I support the comment that autoimmune disorders specifically need to be addressed. 
I have an autoimmune disorder and I've heard similar comments about worry for a relapse. Um, and as somebody working in prioritization with my state, I urge the committee to be clear and create consistent recommendations that can be easily applied at the state level, particularly as we move into additional phases, phase 1B, um, that addresses essential workers. Thank you very much for your time and your efforts. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker will be uh, Mr. Charles Lee, please. Mr. Lee. Good morning or good afternoon. I am Charles Lee. I am with the American College of Correctional Physicians. These are the docs that take care of the inmates and those incarcerated. I'm also talking on behalf of those incarcerated. There are over 2 million persons incarcerated. 250,000 of them have been infected. That's five times the general population. I'm also representing and talking about those who work in correctional facilities, not only the officers, but also the food workers, handlers, those that take care of the maintenance, as well as the medical people. Definition. There's been some confusion as to definitions of what is what. For example, congregate facilities. Does that in and of itself include jails, prisons, and juvenile facilities. In some of the state's directives, it's not clear. Correctional facilities, clinics, and hospitals. What if a correctional facility doesn't have a clinic? Do they still include their inmates and patients to receive the vaccination? Correctional facility healthcare workers, are they included in the initial phase 1A of health care workers? Another factor is age. Generally speaking, they're concerned about individuals greater than 65 years old. Those incarcerated have an advanced age. They are generally, their bodies are generally 10 to 20 years greater than their counterparts in the outside. Therefore, should inmates 55 and greater be considered? Essential workers, there are a lot of essential workers in correctional facilities. Please do not leave them out. Children, juvenile facilities, include them. The states, the states need some direction. They are all over the place with their guidelines and plans. Some include correctional persons first, some include them last. Inmates are at risk, a great risk, similar to that of nursing home persons. There's an increased number of minorities, black and brown, in incarcerated facilities. Please take that into consideration, that whereas for the black community, it's 13% of general population, but in jails and prisons, it's as great as 40%. Again, I thank you for all of the work you've done, we are proud to represent those that are incarcerated and hope that the ACIP takes my thoughts into consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Dorit Reese, please. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Dorit Reese, and I'm a professor of law at the University of California, KC College, College of the Law, and the member of the Vaccine Working Group on Ethics and Policy. I wanted to make four points, let's see if I can get through them. First, I'd like to send, thank the committee for its intensive, transparent work since April, following the vaccine development, asking hard questions, openly providing ex extensive data on this. ACIP's law overseeing vaccines is unique and critical to ensuring ex equitable access to safe and effective vaccines. ACIP has been transparently and openly working on this for years, and we appreciate your uh, efforts applying your expertise to this context as well. I also want to remind you that you're not alone in combating misinformation about vaccines. Our actors like our friend at the Vaccine Information Center or Vaccinate Your Family work hard to provide information and counter news, as do a large group of online debunkers in blogs and comments and news. We will continue to respond to misinformation. Second, echoing the comments of the previous uh, commenter, it's imperative to consider prisons as a vaccine priority site. Drawing on my colleague Adara Viran's data, in California, every single 
facility has a COVID outbreak. A, a third of the entire prison population has been infected with COVID and 96 people have died. That's in one state only. Prison authorities are not always quick in uh, taking measures to allow social distancing and addressing the situation. COVID spikes in prison correlate with spikes in the surrounding and neighboring counties and offering the vaccine to incarcerated people and requiring correctional officers to be vaccinated as condition of employment is essential and the hard work of ensuring buy-in and compliance must start now. Third, I appreciate that you recognize the need for clear guidance on the issues of severe allergic reaction and the need to update it moving forward as the evidence arises. I want to reinforce Dr. Paul Offit's comments in the FDA VERPAC meeting on this and the points made here and ask the committee to make it a priority to figure out which ingredient in the vaccine may cause a severe allergic reaction because we need to know what's causing this fast both to safely give vaccines and to respond to concerns of the public. I also hope you will support an urgent study of the safety of the vaccine in those that are known to be allergic to injectables and non-injectables and appreciate your proposed recommendation that such people be closely observed after vaccination. Finally, although CDC and FDA have previously said that you cannot mandate a vaccine under an EUA, I think that's not a good reflection of the law. The law is ambiguous. And I hope that the committee will ask the FDA commissioner to provide clear guidance in the EUA to private actors what they can and cannot do. Can they impose consequences on refusing a vaccine? Can they require people to wear more PPE if they refuse? Can they require people to be reassigned or even fired? I think business will be looking for ways to encourage vaccines and they need guidance. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, next speaker is Mr. David Schlesch. Mr. Schlesch. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon to this distinguished body. My name is David Schlesch, president of the American Seniors Housing Association. Our members offer the entire spectrum of senior living including independent living, assisted living, memory care, and continuing care retirement communities. On December 1st, this committee recommended that the COVID-19 vaccine be offered to both healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities in the initial phase 1A of the vaccination program. It was widely understood and communicated to the senior living industry by officials of the Department of Health and Human Services that residents of long-term care facilities included, in addition to skilled nursing facilities, the full continuum of senior living care, independent living, assisted living, memory care, and continuing care retirement communities. This was understood when the industry was encouraged, encouraged to register for the CVS Walgreens Pharmacy Program. As a result, operators of all settings registered their communities in anticipation of being treated as, as a prioritized population for access to the vaccine. However, we are now learning that while assisted living communities will be included among the initial vaccination groups, independent living settings will not be considered in the 1A group, and it is unclear whether the independent living section of a building with multiple levels is included. We believe this to be incredibly short-sighted and are deeply troubled by this decision, given the resident population living in these communities and that their uh, risk of contracting the virus is just as great as those living in nursing homes and assisted living communities. Residents of independent living are 82 years old on average and have higher rates of cognitive and functional impairment than those living in private residences. Additionally, many senior living communities offer multiple levels of care. To vaccinate the residents in assisted living, but not in the independent living section of the same community would create confusion, Emotional harm and is simply not efficient in the delivery of the vaccine to the most vulnerable. Our concerns extend to the staff of independent living communities as well. We believe all senior living workers, such as caregivers, dining staff, and others, including those who work in independent living, are an integral part of the essential healthcare workforce and should not be overlooked in the federal plans for vaccine distribution. We ask that as the committee continues to review vaccine prioritization, consideration be given to recommend that all senior living settings, including independent living, be prioritized in the 1A category. Additionally, it is extremely difficult to serve our vulnerable seniors unless the staff in these communities are also vaccinated and free from COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker is Ms. Catherine Falk. Ms. Falk. 
Hi, um, my name is Catherine Falk and I'm a parent and vaccine advocate in Oakland, California. I wanna thank the committee for all your hard work. I appreciate and very much share your concern about myths and misinformation. I've been following and countering the threat of anti-vaccine misinformation online for years. There are broad categories of this misinformation. Some of it is spread by people with, to be blunt, a financial interest in selling services or supplements. But some of it is also passed along by people who are genuinely fearful, who have had a bad experience with the medical system, who don't feel like they can trust mainstream sources. The last four years have been terribly corrosive to public trust. Most of all, it's become very clear that racism continues to be a destructive force in our country. I encourage the committee to address the problem of misinformation as much as possible, particularly as it impacts populations that have experienced historical trauma and continue to. Many of these conversations are going to have to take place within communities as opposed to outsiders lecturing. But if the leaders in those communities can be empowered with resources, that would be very helpful. I also hope that the guidance on how to allocate vaccines can include a conscious, deliberate effort to avoid reinforcing systemic racism and existing inequities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next speaker is Claire Hannon. Ms. Hannon. I'm Claire Hannon, Executive Director of the Association of Immunization Managers. Our nonprofit represents the state, territorial, and large urban area public health immunization program. These amazing government employees have been working with CDC, Operation Warp Speed, state health officials, governors, hospitals, and other stakeholders to plan for the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. Months of vaccine distribution and logistics planning are now coming to fruition. Guidance on subsequent priority groups is needed immediately. Jurisdictions are working now to plan for vaccine allocations coming in the next month. They need to work closely with providers and communicate clearly with consumers about what to expect. Many have advisory committees and ethics groups designed to assure equity and distribution. They cannot effectively plan and communicate expectations without guidance from the ACIP, and there's tremendous pressure on governors. I want to speak specifically to the dilemma facing jurisdictions with essential workers, those over 65 and those with underlying conditions. There is not consensus across states on how to vaccinate these groups. Some governors have signaled the importance of vaccinating the most at risk, the highest at risk first for hospitalization and death, i.e. the older Americans and those with multiple risk conditions. Yet essential workers may be in harm's way and can spread the virus in communities. The current definition of essential workers is extremely broad. For example, the CISA list for essential workers encompasses almost 60% of the population in North Dakota. These factors could lead to very different approaches across states. I urge the ACIP to provide specific guidance on prioritization as soon as possible. Guidance and educational materials are needed on exactly who should receive the vaccine, especially related to pregnant and lactating women, 16 to 17 year olds and those with allergies. Screening questions that can be used by providers would be very helpful. So I'm very glad to hear about the CDC, what you need to know information for vaccine recipients. I'd like to close by reminding the committee and everyone listening of the dire need for additional funding for state, territorial and local public health agencies. Public health agencies have received just $340 million while more than $10 billion has been invested in vaccine research and production. Public health agencies desperately need funding to continue to enroll tens of thousands of providers, to hire community vaccinators and nurses, to purchase equipment and supplies, and to roll out large-scale communication plans with websites, educational materials, and hotlines. Nothing is more important to the success of this campaign than the trust of healthcare workers, nursing home residents, and a and eventually all Americans in every community in the safety and effectiveness of this vaccine. Resources are needed. Thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment on this truly historic day. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, our next speaker is um, Gina Harrison. My name is Gina Garrett Harrison and my son is permanently handicapped 
and medically exempt because of your negligent recommendations. Um, I'm having some issues with the conflicts of interest that your panel's saying that they do not pose, which I would like to ask you how much more of a conflict of interest is having an entire panel of pro-vaccine people recommending vaccines to the entire United States. Where are all the opposing voting members who are also scientists and virologists? And since vaccination is for the public, shouldn't your panel be equally diverse with each side being well represented? We're not only dealing with the pandemic, but we're also dealing with an epidemic of the public's mistrust in your recommendations. And in order for something to be considered science, I believe the public needs to have confidence in you. In your 2020 ACIP meeting in February, you had stated that you didn't even know what the term healthy meant because it had never been defined. This is a huge problem. And in order for something to be rubber stamped, the public needs to be told exactly how these studies are set up, what type of placebo is being used, and which formula placebo is being used. And we are hoping that you know this information. Do you? Is the placebo another vaccine? Is it the vaccine's adjuvant? Is it the lipids that are questionable at best? The, uh, the, the public also needs to know the exclusion tr criteria from the study and how these test subjects were screened to the fullest. They were physically, mentally, and lab confirmed to be the healthiest participant receiving this vaccine. And it's interesting because one of the things that completely disqualified you as a participant was having a history of vaccine reactions such as anaphylaxis or any reaction to any of the components in the study intervention. And something tells me that when somebody checked that box, they finally listened, and I bet they were shooed off really quick. The public also needs to know that this vaccine has not been proven to prevent transmission. You're recommending all these healthcare employees to take this vaccine that may not even protect them against the infection. They'll take it thinking that they're safe, only to have their symptoms reduced, just like whooping calls, and they become super spreaders without even knowing it. The public also needs to know that the 1976 national fake swine flu epidemic that, struck, that spawned a very strong vaccination push that also generated numerous lawsuits due to the number of deaths that were caused. This is the, a repeat. It's history repeating itself. And we are so tired of you walking through your job with blonders. We are the ones that are paying for your shady, you for underhanded, your fraudulent data expired. and the lies that you have built this vaccine schedule on. And it's past time that you are held accountable because unavoidably unsafe is Thank you for those comments. Uh, we will move on to our final speaker, Mr. Tom Rosenberg. Thank you, Dr. Mero. I'm Tom Rosenberg, President and CEO of the American Camp Association. I appreciate the opportunity to address the CDC ACIP committee. On behalf of the ACA and 47 other uh, national out-of-school time youth educational organizations, we have submitted written comments to the committee to ensure that all categories of essential child care workers in all out-of-school time settings are prioritized for early allocation of COVID-19 vaccines within the education sector. This position is in accord with the criteria set forth in the guidance provided uh, by the Department of Homeland Security. Workers supporting the education of our children and adult learners in a myriad of settings qualify as essential crit critical infrastructure workers as defined by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. The ongoing availability of healthy staff and continuous operation of these Valuable out-of-school time programs is critical to the economic recovery of our country. Workers operating in out-of-school time settings, such as organized camps, after-school programs, child care, community-based centers, and recreation programs provide essential services to early learners and students and to their working parents and caregivers. Hundreds of camps are engaged with their local school districts and municipalities in a variety of ways now as alternative learning centers. Most of these out-of-school programs provide in-person early and K-12 through learning support and enrichment, while others facilitate safe and supervised care for children who are participating in distance learning in partnership with families, local municipalities, and school departments. 
Our workforce has enabled healthcare and frontline workers to attend to their essential duties with the confidence in knowing that their children, infants to teenagers, are being supervised, well taken care of, and benefiting from in-person ed education. These workers have carried out these duties despite the loss of substantial revenue due to COVID-19 impacts on the economy. As we move ahead into spring and summer, many more community centers, after-school programs, recreational areas, and organized camps are planning to open and hire staff to provide continuing service and care to our children, young adults, and working parents and caregivers. We therefore urge you to include these workers in the CDC ACIP vaccine allocation and distribution recommendations for the education sector to be eligible for phase 1B access to COVID-19 vaccinations when available. I sincerely appreciate this opportunity to present to the committee and look forward to working with the CDC as a valuable partner, as well as others in the implementation and rollout of vaccines to these workers. Thank you all for your hard work and have a good day. Thank you for your comments. And I wanna thank everybody uh, on the public speaking list uh, for their comments. We do appreciate them and we take them into account. So um, I will now ask uh, the uh, voting members to please um, open their cameras as we proceed to the votes. Dr. Cohn or Dr. Massonier, do you wish to address the, the voting members before we begin? Uh, Dr. Romero, we are pulling up uh, the language for the first vote, um, but I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Massonier to make a comment before the vote. Um, uh, this is Dr. Massonier from CDC. I just um, want to thank the ACIP members, liaisons, and ex officio members for the um, past two days, as well as for the multiple past months of um, their careful thought on these issues, as I think were noted by several members of the public. Um, we look to this committee to be um, scientifically driven and transparent, and you have certainly fulfilled that responsibility. I know you share um, with me the, the um, the burden of the importance of this moment that we find ourselves in after so long and so much work by so many parties um, around the world to have this vaccine in front of us available for this vote um, it, it, it is a high honor. And, um, and we all understand that um, if ACIP votes today for this vaccine, this is only one step. Um, there is much work left to do, but it's a hugely important step. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Cohen, may I proceed to take the vote? Yes. So um, before we proceed with the vote, I just want to remind all the members to please um, have their uh, videos on. Give us one second. We're going to change the view. Um, we also want to remind all members that we will um, do both sets of votes, and then we will provide each member an opportunity to make a statement explaining their vote after uh, the vote has concluded. Thank you very much. For the public, again, um, I wish to note that uh, three voting members have indicated conflicts and will not be issuing a vote. However, I will ask the three voting members when I call your name to please state that you recruit, the, you recruit, recuse yourself. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, that you recuse yourself. All right. So um, I will begin uh, calling the roll alphabetically with your chair last, um, and begin with uh, Dr. Robert Atmar. Dr. At Atmar, how do you vote? Atmar recuse. Thank you, sir. Doc, uh, Ms. Lynn Bata. Yes. Dr. Beth Bell. Bell? Yes. I believe I did something out of order here. I should have read the uh, vote. Forgive my error on, uh, on that. Let me read that vote, the item to be voted on, um, and then uh, we'll restate the votes. Uh, excuse the, uh, the error by your chair. So to begin, the question at hand is as follows. The Pfizer-BioNTech 
COVID-19 vaccine is recommended for persons 16 years, 16 years of age and older in the U.S. population under the FDA's emergency use authorization. So we will now vote on this, and I will start from the top again. Forgive me. Dr. Kevin Alt. Alt, yes. Thank you. Dr. Atmar. Atmar recuse. Ms. Bata. Bata, yes. Dr. Bell. Bell, yes. Dr. Bernstein. Bernstein, yes. Dr. Fry. Fry, recuse. Dr. Hunter. Hunter, recuse. Dr. Lee. Lee, yes. Ms. McNally. McNally, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, yes. Dr. Salaji. Salaji, yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, yes. Romero, yes. Dr. Cohn, the vote is 11 in favor, three recused. The motion passes. Next motion, please. Uh, Dr. Romero, I concur with your count, and I want to remind the voting members that um, on the schedule amendment, um, all members uh, can vote. So again, I will uh, read the, uh, the motion, uh, and we will start alphabetically. Um, and as Dr. Cohen has pointed out, all members may vote. So the motion recommend the proposed amendment to the 2021 adult and child adolescent immunization schedules. We will begin. Dr. Atmar. Atmar, yes. Dr. Alt. Alt, yes. Dr. Bata. Bata, yes. Excuse me, Ms. Bata. Um, Dr. Bell. Hell, yes. Dr. Bernstein. Bernstein, yes. Dr. Fry. Fry, yes. Dr. Hunter. Hunter, yes. Dr. Lee. Lee, yes. Ms. McNally. McNally, yes. Dr. Paling. Hailing, yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, yes. Dr. Salaji. Salaji, yes. Dr. Talbot. Talbot, yes. Romero, yes. Dr. Cohn, we have 14 votes in favor, none opposed, none recused. The motion passes. Yes, I concur. The motion passes. Thank you all very much for that vote. Um, we'll now open it up to comments uh, from the uh, members of the ACIP, the voting members of the ACIP. Um, please go forward, whoever wishes. And I'm sorry, let me just pull the, uh, the list over. Give us just a second. Okay. Um, I see Dr. Talbot is first yeah. on the list. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to all the incredible civil servants who have worked tirelessly to make this happen. Um, this is our first kind of big break in this epidemic. And um, many of our civil servants at both the CDC, the FDA, and the states um, have been working crazy hours with no extra pay, all um, to make this U.S. a better place. And I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Dr. Salaji, please. Yes, uh, first I wanted to give a really big thank you to everybody who's on this video, to the ACIP voting members, 
to the liaisons and affiliated organizations whom I so admire. And I really wanted to thank the CDC work group, the COVID work group, the CDC leaders and the thousands of people at CDC uh, who are, are working on this pandemic and on the vaccine. I want to say that I voted for the vaccine because of the clear evidence of its efficacy, safety profile, and benefit risk profile based on our evidence to policy framework. I wanted to emphasize that this recommendation is within the context of our prior phased allocation recommendation. And as a pediatrician, I wanted to say strongly that I felt 16 to 17 year olds should be included in the routine vaccine recommendation for COVID, for, in, the, in the COVID vaccine recommendation because of the risks from the disease and the lack of any evidence to suggest that the efficacy or safety profile should be different for 16 to 17 year olds than for 18 to 25 year olds. I also wanted to reemphasize what many people and I have said today for the need for substantially increased government funding to actually implement the recommendation. So this is government funding to state and local public health organizations and also funding to health systems and health providers. So I know we're gonna have very tough and sad times ahead because of the surge in a limited vaccine supply, but I am really hopeful that this is the beginning of the end of the coronavirus pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much here. Um, Dr. Bell has brought something to my attention and I want to be sure that, um, it, that, I, that, I, that something was not amiss. So Dr. Alt, did I happen to skip you on the vote, sir? You skipped me uh, because you didn't read the vote, but I voted yes for both proposals. Okay. You you got me the second time around, so so I got to vote. I'm happy. I'm sorry. For, forgive me, uh, Dr. Cohen. Do we need to do anything to go back and amend that so that is there is no doubt about this vote? I, we're good, Dr. Romero. Okay. Again, uh, your chair does, uh, begs forgiveness for that oversight. Um, so uh, we will continue with, uh, with our comments. Uh, Dr. Bell, thank you again for the, uh, pointing out the oversight, and uh, please go forward with your comments. Thank you, Dr. Romero. You actually fixed the oversight um, without my intervention. So. Um, so I, I wanted to, um, first of all, um, reflect on um, all of the suffering that all of us here in the United States and around the world um, are going through under the pandemic and say that um, the vaccine, this vaccine and future vaccines do provide a promise um, of um, a lot of progress in the future. While, um, of course, for the moment, um, our vaccine supplies are going to be limited for quite some time to come, I think. I wanted to um, say that I do believe that um, the process that we have used here uh, in the ACIP to reach this decision is transparent, is science-based, keeps uh, equity uh, in mind, and is, for this moment, um, the absolute best that we can do. I also wanted to uh, recognize people's concerns about this vaccine and other vaccines and new vaccines and say that oftentimes one um, consideration or one factor uh, that people consider is they say, well, would you take this vaccine and would you give this vaccine to your family members? And I can um, say quite confidently that, yes, I certainly will take this vaccine when I'm able and I would give it to my family members. And I think that the risk benefit um, is, um, is pretty clear. Um, finally, I wanted to just um, raise two important points that have been raised by others, but I'll just also add my voice. The first is the importance of, of clear communication. And, and I, I know that the CDC, uh, as well as many partner organizations are very skilled in this. Um, and are stand ready to provide clear communication over and over again. And I, I would hope that um, this would be facilitated and this would be recognized as an important component uh, of our vaccination program. And the second is the point that has been made several times now, which is about funding. 
And I don't think it's unfair or unreasonable to make a comparison between the amount of money, the billions of dollars that have gone to the development of vaccines. Granted, uh, I certainly um, recognize what a huge accomplishment that has been and continues to be, but I think that the imbalance between that kind of money and the funding that has been provided for the vaccination programs and for implementation is really shocking and needs to be corrected uh, because we are not going to be able to protect the American public if we don't have a way to deliver the vaccines to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. McNally. This COVID-19 vaccine offers us hope. It's important to remember that while this vaccine has been developed at an incredible pace and involves new technology, it's gone through all the appropriate regulatory channels and the approval processes have been transparent. The ACIP has held nine meetings since February of 2020, including this meeting yesterday and today. We've heard over 70 presentations on COVID-19 and the COVID-19 vaccine. We've considered the disease epidemiology, benefits and harms, values, acceptability, feasibility, resource use, and equity. Regarding safety, we saw that reactive donicity events were transient and resolved within a couple of days after onset, and the incidence of severe or serious, excuse me, adverse events was similar to the vaccine and placebo, placebo groups with 0.6% and 0.5% respectively. Regarding the effectiveness of this vaccine, we saw that overall efficacy was 95%. There are things we don't know yet, but many issues were addressed during the clinical considerations presentation today. By way of example, there are unknowns regarding pregnancy and lactating women, and there's limited data for 16 and 17 year olds, but additional data will become available. And I was reassured by the comments from ACOG and AAP on these issues. The CDC has done an incredible job in spite of the immense time crunch, getting information on its website about what to expect after vaccination, the benefits of vaccination, and the latest recommendation for who should be vaccinated. We heard today about the CDC consumer-friendly fact sheet that will be provided to recipients in addition to the EUA fact sheet. Over the past several months, as the consumer representative, I've asked questions I think the public has. I have, I, I believe the ACIP process has worked. I value the expertise of my ACIP colleagues, as well as the CDC's expertise, guidance, and tireless dedication. The theme that has emerged for me is a commitment to continuously collect, review, and report data. The systems are in place. And that vaccine safety and effect data will continue to inform clinical guidance and recommendation for COVID-19 vaccines. The need for this vaccine is profound. Because the current data support this vaccine, that it's safe and effective for the majority of people, I voted yes. Thank you, Ms. McNally. Dr. Bernstein. Yes, thank you, Dr. Romero. I too extend my uh, deep and sincere appreciation to the CDC leaders, COVID-19 work group, the multiple liaisons and partners, and to the public, because together we all will help to make the United States and the world safer. With the pandemic resulting in thousands of deaths each day, keeping equity in mind, and knowing 16 and 17 year olds are actively being studied, I voted in favor of both items. I also recognize that this teenage group can actively transmit SARS-CoV-2 infection to contacts in their families and communities. I would still propose that we consider adding this age group as a special population in these interim clinical considerations explaining that available data is limited at this time. Child health providers will benefit from additional specific detail in recommending and discussing COVID-19 vaccines with, patients, with parents, families, and communities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sanchez.
Dr. Sanchez, uh, we are having problems hearing you. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so um, I also want to thank the CDC and the COVID work group for their amazing and ongoing work. Um, it's, it's been really an, an amazing and um, well thought out process. Um, I very much agree with the approval of this vaccine as stated uh, based on its strong efficacy and safety, uh, knowing that there will be ongoing evaluation um, on both ends. And also, um, I really feel that this is a, a, a really important beginning um, in terms of trying to end this pandemic and deal with it in an effective manner. Um, I think that, um, that I also would recommend it for myself and my family. I feel very comfortable with this recommendation, but I also feel very strongly that it needs to be allocated in a fair manner based on risk factors, um, such as we and other CRS CDC are doing. Um, really, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to work on this, um, on this um, recommendation. Thank you very much. Do any of the other, any other voting member wish to make a statement? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Paling, I'm sorry, there you go. All right, thank you. Just 12 months ago, COVID-19 pneumonia was first identified. I want to thank the many scientists whose work over decades and the past year has enabled the creation and assessment of vaccines, as well as the many analyses that have been publicly reviewed. I want to thank the many participants of the vaccine trials that have enabled the EUA. I want to thank all those at the CDC, FDA, and many, many more who have worked under incredible time pressure to transparently share the information needed. The collaborative work and sharing data throughout the process has enabled all the processes needed to um, approve or to submit an um, a EUA and has been fulfilled without any shortcuts. I express tremendous gratitude to all of those in the work group who have diligently informed and prepared us for this moment. The gravity of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic needs to be underscored. Over 15 million Americans have been infected and over 291,000 have died. Many Americans are experiencing negative impacts from COVID-19. The FDA issued this EUA after a careful review of safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. While more information will continue to become available, at this time, we are asked how to do the greatest good. As the pandemic continues to spread, hospitalizations are at record levels, I vote to make vaccines available by the CDC's prioritization schedule. I will take this vaccine and will recommend it to my family members as well, as well when that time is, is offered. A highly immunogenic vaccine will also have expected reactions. There are multiple safety monitoring systems and a newly created vaccine safety technical subgroup to carefully review all data. Revisions and update of information are expected and reflect that the process is working. As vaccines begin to be offered, it is important that the vaccine is offered to all within each priority group and will require outreach and communication to, equitable, to achieve the equitable distribution desired. There is much work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other voting members that wish to make a statement? Then I'll take this moment to add my comments uh, to the uh, to the list of comments that have already been made, and many of these have already been covered. But let me begin by thanking everyone at the CDC, the senior leadership, uh, Dr. Cohn, Dr. Messonnier, uh, uh, all of the working group, Drs. Uh, Dooling, Oliver Mumbay, uh, our work group chair, Dr. Bell, the voting members, uh, including uh, Dr. Talbot. Um, and Dr. Lee, and all of the ACIP members, which uh, would take too long to read at this point, the liaisons, uh, the um, ex officios, and also a group that we have not acknowledged as much as we should, 
which are the subgroup uh, for uh, vaccine safety. Thank you very much for your efforts and deliberations on this. I want to make a comment for the public um, in general. Um, ACIP has worked to deliver vaccine to, to the general public that maximizes benefit, minimizes harm, addresses issues of equity and issues of healthcare disparity. The vote taken today represents the work carried out over nine months since April of this year. The deliberations have been thorough and have been in depth. No question that we felt was important was left unturned. All data was present, presented to us as we asked for. There has been a thorough, robust, in-depth discussion. We now present to you, the general public the ability to prevent, back, to prevent COVID-19 COVID disease. These deliberations um, are important in coming to the recommendations. I want to stress that we have throughout this process looked at safety, and I know that safety is an issue that is of concern to the public. At all stages of the development and, and approval and further uh, recommendations for this vaccine, uh, safety has been listed as a priority by the FDA and by the ACIP. We hope that the public has a confidence in this. Speaking as a person of color, I am grateful that the pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, have included minority, minority populations in this study, and we have data from those groups. So I want to thank everyone. I want to also mention that what has been mentioned before, that if and when my turn comes to receive this vaccine, I will receive it without hesitancy. So with that, unless there are other comments by, uh, the, um, by Dr. Cohn, um, I will gavel this meeting to a Dr. close. Dr. Romero, Dr. I just wanted to, yes. before you gavel, I just wanted to remind everybody that, that at this time we have um, a whole another two-day meeting uh, set up for next weekend on Friday, December 18th and December 20th. Um, same alert and notification if Pfizer issues an EUA for the, if Moderna issue, if, if the FDA issues an emergency use authorization for the Moderna product prior